I'm Hog, this is the Dice, and it's Christmas Eve, or at least it is now when you're watching this. And for this Christmas Eve, we're going to be bringing back the spooky fuckboy adventure hour. We're doing this on Christmas Eve to help bring back that old Christmas Eve tradition of telling ghost stories in the lead up to Christmas. In fact, Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol was written to be part of that tradition. The story we're going to be reading today is one called The Good Woman, and it was collected by Thomas Crofton Cloak. In a pleasant and not unpicturesque valley of the White Knight's country, at the foot of the Galtee Mountains lived Larry Dodd and his wife, Nancy. They rented a cabin and a few acres of land, which they cultivated with great care, and its crops rewarded their industry. They were independent and respected by their neighbours. They loved each other in a marriageable sort of way and few couples had altogether more the appearance of comfort about them. Larry was a hard-working and occasionally a hard-drinking Dutch-built little man with a fiddle head and a round stern, a steady-going, straightforward fellow, barring when he carried too much whiskey, which, it must be confessed, might occasionally prevent him walking the chalked line with perfect philomathical accuracy. He had a moist, ruddy countenance, rather inclined to an expression of gravity, and particularly so in the morning. But taken altogether, he was generally looked upon as a marvellously proper person, notwithstanding he had, every day in the year, a sort of unholy dew upon his face, even in the coldest weather, which gave rise to a supposition of almost censorious persons, of course, that Larry was apt to indulge in strong and frequent potations. However, all men of talents have their faults. Indeed, who is without them? And as Larry, setting aside his domestic virtues and skill in farming, was decidedly the most distinguished breaker of horses for forty miles round, he must be, in some degree, excused, considering the inducements of the Stirrup Cup and the fox hunting society in which he mixed. If he had also been the greatest drunkard in the county, but in truth, that was not the case. Larry was a man of mixed habits, as well in his mode of life and his drink as in his costume. His dress accorded well with his character, a sort of half and half between farmer and horse jock. He wore a blue coat of coarse cloth with short skirts and a stand-up collar. His waistcoat was red and his lower habiliments were made of leather which in course of time had shrunk so much that they fitted like a second skin. And long use had absorbed their moisture to such a degree that they made a strange sort of crackling noise as he walked along. A hat covered with oilskin, a cutting whip, all worn and jagged at the end, a pair of second hand, or to speak more correctly, second footed, greasy top boots, that seemed never to have imbibed a refreshing draught of Warren's blacking of matchless luster, and one spur without a rowel completed the everyday dress of Larry Dodd. Thus equipped was Larry, returning from Cashel, mounted on a rough-coated and wall-eyed nag, though, notwithstanding these and a few other trifling blemishes, a well-built animal. Having just purchased the said nag, with a fancy that he could make his own money again of his bargain, and maybe turn an odd penny more by it at the ensuing Kildorary Fair. Well pleased with himself, 
He trotted fair, he thought indeed, was passing in his mind, when his attention was roused by a woman, pacing quickly by the side of his horse, and hurrying on, as if endeavouring to reach her destination before the night closed in. Her figure, considering the long strides she took, appeared to be under the common size, rather of the dumpy order, but further as to whether the damsel was young or old, fair or brown, pretty or ugly, Harry could form no precise notion from her wearing a large cloak, the usual garb of the female Irish peasant, the hood of which was turned up and completely concealed every feature. Enveloped in this mass of dark and concealing drapery, the strange woman, without much exertion, contrived to keep up with Larry Dodd's steed for some time. When his master very civilly offered her a lift behind him as far as he was going her way, civility begets civility, they say. However, he received no answer and thinking that the lady's silence proceeded only from bashfulness. Like a man of true gallantry, not a word more, said Larry, until he pulled up by the side of a gap, and then says he, Bochaleen, Bochaleen Bjog, my little girl, just jump up behind me without a word more, though never a one have you spoke and I'll take you safe and sound through the lonesome bit of road that is before us. She jumped at the offer, sure enough, and up with her on the back of the horse as light as a feather. In an instant, there she was seated up behind Larry, with her hand and arm buckled around his waist, holding up. I hope you're comfortable there, my dear, said Larry, in his own good-humoured way. But there was no answer. And on they went, trot, 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 along the road. And all was so still, and so quiet, that you might have heard the sound of the hoofs on the limestone a mile off. For that matter, there was nothing else to hear, except the moaning of a distant stream, that kept up a continued cronane, like a nurse hush up. Larry, who had a keen ear, did not, however, require so profound a silence to detect the clip of one of the shoes. "'Tis only loose the shoe is," said he to his companion, as they were just entering on the lonesome bit of road of which he had before spoken. Some old trees with huge trunks, all covered and irregular branches festooned with ivy, grew over a dark pool of water which had been formed as a drinking place for cattle, and the distance was seen the majestic head of Gelty Moor. Here the horse, as if in grateful recognition, made a dead halt. And Larry, not knowing what vicious tricks his new purchase might have, and unwilling that through any odd chance the young woman should get spilt in the water, dismounted, thinking to leading the horse quietly by the poop. By the piper's look that always found what he wanted, said Larry, recollecting himself, I've a nail in my pocket. Tis not the first time I've put on a shoe, and maybe it won't be the last, for here is no want of paving stones to make hammers in plenty. No sooner was Larry off than off with a spring came the young woman just at his side. Her feet touched the ground without making the least noise in life, and away she bounded like an ill-mannered wench as she was, without saying by your leave, or no matter what else. She seemed to glide rather than run, not along the road, but across a field, up towards the old ivy-covered walls of Kiln, a slattery church, and a pretty church it was. Not so fast, if you please, young woman, not so fast, cried Larry, calling after her, but away she ran. And Larry followed, his leathern garment already described crack, crick, crackling at every step he took. Where's my wages? said Larry. Horum hog, mucholin hog, 
Give me a kiss, my young girl. Should I've earned a kiss from your pair of pretty lips, and I'll have it too. But she went on faster and faster, regardless of these and other flattering speeches from her pursuer. At last she came to the churchyard wall, and then over with her in an instant. And she's a mighty smart creature anyhow, to be sure how neat she steps upon her pastor. Did anyone ever see the like of that before? But I'll not be balked by any woman that ever wore a head or any ditch either, exclaimed Larry, as with a desperate bound he vaulted, scrambled, and tumbled over the wall into the churchyard. Up he got from the elastic sod of a newly made grave, in which Tade Leary that morning was buried, rest his soul. And on went Larry, stumbling over headstones and footstones, over old graves and new graves, pieces of coffins, and the skulls and bones of dead men the Lord saves, that were scattered about there as plenty as paving stones. Floundering amidst great overgrown duck leaves and brambles that with their long prickly arms tangled around his limbs and held him back with a fearful grasp. Meantime, the merry wench in the cloak moved through all these obstructions as evenly and as gaily as, the, as if the churchyard, crowded up as it was with the graves and gravestones, had been the floor of a dancing room. Round and round the walls of the old church she went. I'll just wait, said Larry, seeing this and thinking it all nothing but a trick to frighten her. When she comes round again, if I don't take a kiss, I won't, that's all. And here she is. Larry Dodd sprung forward with open arms and clasped in them a woman, it is true, but a woman without any lips to kiss, by reason of her having no head. Murder, cried he. Well, that accounts for her not speaking. Having uttered these words, Larry himself became dumb with fear and astonishment. His blood seemed turned to ice, and a dizziness came over him. And staggering like a drunken man, he rolled against the broken window of the ruin, fortified at the conviction that he had actually held a doulahan in his embrace when he recovered to something like a feeling of consciousness. He slowly opened his eyes, and then, indeed, a scene of wonder burst upon him. In the midst of the ruin stood an old wheel of torch, ornamented with heads like Corp Jail, when the heads of Marty Sullivan and other gentlemen were stuck upon it. This was plainly visible in the strange light which spread itself around. It was fearful to behold, but Larry could not choose but look, for his limbs were powerless through the wonder and the fear. Useless as it was, he would have called for help, but his tongue cleaved to the roof of his mouth. And not one word could he say. In short, there was Larry, gazing through a shuttered window of the old church, with eyes bleared and almost starting from their sockets. His breast rested on the thickness of the wall, over which, on one side, his head and outstretched neck projected. And on the other, Although one toe touched the ground, it arrived no support from them. Terror, as it were, kept him balanced. Strange noises assailed his ears, until at last they tingled painfully to the sharp clatter of little bells, which kept up a continued ding, ding, ding. Marrowless bones rattled and clanked, and the deep 
and solemn sound of a great bell came booming on the night wind. Twas a spectre run, that bell when it swung, swing, swang, and the chain it squeaked, and the pulley clicked, swing, swang, and with every roll of the deep death toll ding dong, the hollow vault rang as the clapper went by, ding dong. It was strange music to dance with. Nevertheless, moving to it, round and round the wheels set with skulls, were well-dressed ladies and gentlemen and soldiers and sailors and priests and publicans and jockeys and jennies, but all without their heads. Some poor skeletons whose bleached bones were ill-covered by moth-eaten pears and who were not admitted into the ring amused themselves by bowling their brainless noddles at one another, which seemed to enjoy the sport beyond measure. Barry did not know what to think. His brains were all in a mist, and losing the balance which he had so long maintained, he fell head foremost into the midst of the company of Dulahads. I'm done for and lost forever, roared Larry with his heels turned towards the stars, and soused down he came. Welcome, Larry Dad, welcome, cried every head, bobbing up and down in the air. A drink for Larry Dad! shouted they, as with one voice that quavered like a shake on the bagpipes. No sooner said than done, for a player at heads, catching his own as it was bowled at him, for fear of its going astray, jumped up, put the head without a word under his left arm, and with the right stretched out, presented a brimming cup to land, who, to show his manners, drank it off like a man. "'Tis capital stuff,' he would have said, which surely it was. But he got no further than cap, when decapitated was he. And his head began dancing over his shoulders like those of the rest of the party. Larry, however, was not the first man who lost his head through the temptation of looking at the bottom of a brimming cup. Nothing more did he remember clearly, for it seems body and head being parted is not very favourable to thought. But a great hurry scurry with the noise of carriages and the cracking of whips. When his senses returned, his first act was to pull up his hand to where his head formerly grew. And to his great joy, there he found it still. He then shook it gently. But his head remained firm enough, and somewhat assured at this, he proceeded to open his eyes and look around him. It was broad daylight, and in the old church of Kilna Slattery, he found himself lying with that head, the loss of which he had anticipated, quietly resting, poor youth, upon the lap of a. Could it have been an ugly dream? Oh no, sir. A dream could never have brought me here, stretched on the flat of my back, with that death's head and cross marrow bones for, for anointing me on the fine old tombstone, there that was faced by Pat Kearney of Kilcree. But where is the horse? He got up slowly, every joint aching with pain from the bruises he had received, and went to the pool of water. But no horse was there. "'Tis home I must go,' said Larry, with a rueful countenance. "'But how will I face Nancy? Wait till I tell her about the horse, and the seven IOUs that he cost me. "'Tis them hands that have made their own of him from me. "'The horse-stealing robbers of the world that have no fear of the gallows. "'But what's gone is gone. That's a clear cause.' "'So saying, he turned his steps home.' and arrived at his cabin about noon, 
without encountering any further adventure. Uh, there he found Nancy, who, as he expected, looked as black as a thundercloud at him for being out all night. She listened to the marvellous relation which he gave with exclamations of astonishment. And when he had concluded, of grief at the loss of the horse that he had paid for like an honest man in IOUs, three of which she knew to be as good as gold. But what took you up to the old church at all, out of the road, and at that time of night, Larry? inquired his wife. Larry looked like a criminal for whom there was no reprieve. He scratched his head for an excuse but not one could he muster up. So he knew no, so he knew not what to say. Oh, Larry, Larry, muttered Nancy, after waiting some time for his answer. Her jealous fears during the pause, her eyes in like barm. Tis the very same way with you as with any other man. You are all alike for that matter. I've no pity for you. But confess the truth. Larry shuddered at the tempest, which he perceived was about to break upon his devoted head. Nancy, said he, I do confess. It was a young woman without any head that... His wife heard no more. A woman, I knew it was, cried she. But a woman without a head, Larry. Well, it is long before Nancy Gallagher ever thought it would come to that with her, that she would be left dissolute and alone by her best of a husband for a woman without a head. Oh, father, father, and oh, mother, mother, it is well you are low today that you don't see this affliction and disgrace to your daughter, that you rear decent and tender. Oh, Larry, you villain! You'll be the death of your lawful wife going after such, oh, oh, oh. Well, said Larry, putting his hands in his coat pockets. Least said is soonest mended. Of the young woman, I know no more than I do of Mal Flanders. But this I know, that a woman without a head may well be called a good woman, because she has no tongue. How this remark operated on the matrimonial dispute, history does not inform us. It is, however, reported that the lady had the last word. And that was the story of Larry Dodd and the Good Woman. Larry was an awful prick, I'm sure you've noticed. And that's the end of this entry of the Spooky Fuckboy Adventure Hour. If you want more stories that are Christmas themed, I've put a link to a playlist somewhere in the cards, also in the description below. I hope you will all enjoy listening to that. And please remember that your applause is the only way to counteract my daily chant of I don't believe.